So I hope you enjoy uh, the, the webinar and we will start with uh, Romana Hussein's talk uh, uh, that is called Choroidal Melanocytic Lesions, When to Watch and When to Treat. Hello everybody, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me for giving me this talk. Uh, my name is Romana, I work at the Liverpool Ocular Oncology Centre and I wanted to talk about lesions like this really. So these are the kind of um, lesions that we get in the ocular oncology unit and you can see that there's a wide range of different um, phenotypic types. Uh, you've got suspicious lesions that have subretinal fluid, although this looks a little bit chronic because of the drusen. This is quite raised. This has orange pigment and subretinal fluid, and this just has orange pigment. So with all these variations in phenotypes, how can you tell what is benign, what's malignant, and how can you tell what you should treat and what you shouldn't? The problem is that all of these uh, images are of choroidal melanomas that have been biopsy proven and actually all of them are not only that, they are melosomy 3 tumours, which means that they have a, a high risk of metastatic disease and they're highly lethal tumours. So it is important to try and differentiate these, whether they're large or small, what type of tumour they are. And the Shields group uh, over 20 years ago now described a number of risk factors to try and give us some kind of clinical clues to see whether we can differentiate uh, malignant disease from benign disease. So orange pigment, subretinal fluids, large tumours and low reflectivity on the ultrasound. Um, lesions near the disc have now been scrapped on the more recent updated guidelines from 2018 um, and visual symptoms, which was a bit non-specific, has been replaced by something more specific where the vision has dropped due to direct results of the tumour. And so because of that, the oncology centre um, for every single patient goes through each of these modalities of imaging, uh, really to look for every single one of those risk factors. Probably the most difficult risk factor to spot uh, clinically is orange pigment, uh, mainly because the choroid is uh, kind of a similar color to the orange pigment, so the contrast isn't there. The easiest way to pick that up really is with autofluorescence, and you can see the hyper-autofluorescent areas that really highlight those areas of lipofusin and also highlight the areas of exudative activity around it. So autofluorescence is really very useful. And although it can pick up this orange pigment on the pigmented lesions, on the more amelanotic types, you can see the pigmented, partially pigmented lesion, you can see these orange areas on the pigmented part, but in the non-pigmented part, these appear brown, but they appear as similarly hyper-autofluorescent on the autofluorescence picture. So the autofluorescence will really give you a clue as to whether there's lipofusin or not. So if you take something like this uh, reasonably simple case uh, of a small lesion, it's near the disc, but we know now that that's not a relevant risk factor. Um, and if you look at the autofluorescence, there's no activity on here. There's no orange pigment. There's no signs of um, exudative changes. The OCT doesn't show you much other than some nerve fiber layers through the disc. But if you focus a bit further back with an EDI OCT, you can see it quite nicely here. This choroidal lesion, it's very small, there's no fluid, there's no risk factors. And so this is a simple choroidal nevus. And so this is easy enough, no risk factors, choroidal nevus, benign lesion. Um, although the risk of this turning into a malignant melanoma is extremely low, it's not zero. And so we do recommend that these patients get uh, long-term monitoring, but that doesn't have to be in the hospital setting. That can really be in the community as well. And a lot of optometrists are quite happy to do that. The main thing is to make sure that they have a baseline photograph so that in the future, if it is, there is a suggestion of change, you have a baseline image to, to compare it to. On the other end of the spectrum are these larger pigmented lesions. So you can see this large pigmented tumor here that actually is quite diffuse in its nature, orange pigment, so much subretinal fluid that it's now caused an exudative retinal detachment with a solid tumor underneath. And on the ultrasound sometimes, not only is it low reflectivity, you can see these blood vessels pul um, pulsing within it uh, to give you an idea that it's more a malignant tumor rather than a benign tumor. And this one is obviously going to be treated. It's a malignant melanoma. Uh, the question is, why are you treating this patient? They have no visual potential. The only treatment for something like this is enucleation. Um, and so the reasons really to treat this is if this tumor is allowed to continue to progress, uh, you will get an, a further exudative detachment, sometimes rebiotic glaucoma, and then end up with a painful blind eye, which will end up needing enucleation anyway. And also the other reason is if this tumor progresses, uh, you may get progression through the sclera and extraocular extension, which in itself is a risk factor, independent risk factor for metasta increased metastatic disease. So those are the reasons really to treat these big tumors as you would expect. <laughs> 
but realistically you want to catch them more when they're at this level. Uh, so this is another melanoma with orange pigment subretinal fluid over two millimeters on the ultrasound and low reflectivity that you can see on the image there. But because it's smaller, you can now treat that with plaque brachytherapy. You can preserve the visual structures like the disc and the fovea. Um, and that means you can treat this safely, preserve vision, preserve the eye. Um, and so you want to treat it more at this stage before it progresses to that more advanced stage that we saw earlier. The more difficult ones are something like this. So this is a patient with uh, a lesion very close to the fovea, but completely asymptomatic. So you'd assume that something active here would give you some visual symptoms, but this patient had none. Uh, the lesion has some orange pigment over the top and maybe a bit of subretinal fluid, but the ultrasound isn't very typical, uh, medium reflectivity also. <clears throat> The patient at the bottom, similarly, uh, atypical lesion, uh, but the lesion has no risk factors such as orange pigment or subretinal fluid, but has low reflectivity on the ultrasound. And so with these lesions that are a little bit in the middle, you haven't got anything definitive to say it's definitely a malignant melanoma, or it's definitely a benign lesion, you have one or two risk factors, we call them indeterminate choroidal lesions, um, and it's reasonable then to monitor them to see if they progress. And this is the whole point of photo documentation, making sure they have a baseline photo, because without a baseline photo, it might be difficult to see that along this blood vessel here, you can definitely see this tumour is progressing, this is getting thicker, there is more obvious orange pigment, and this is definitely a melanoma. Even in the one below, if you don't have a photo, it would be very, very difficult to spot that this area is getting bigger and thicker. And again, this is a melanoma as well, because it is progressing. Even more difficult are some of these ones. This is an amelotic lesion with partial pigmentation in the middle and around the outside of it. But if you look at the OCT, you can see it's coming from the choroid. It's got a little bit of subretinal fluid. The autofluorescence does show that this area of pigment is actually lipofuscin because it's highlighting on the autofluorescence. And you can see this exudative activity down here. And actually the dynamic B scan does show you low reflectivity with a nice slice through it, just like a melanoma. So actually this is a choroidal melanoma. Problem is, do you treat these small melanomas? You can see this area, this one here is a small melanoma. It's less than two millimeters thick. It's very close to the fovea. And this is a picture from earlier, another small melanoma, very close to the fovea. In asymptomatic patients like these, do you treat these because actually, any treatment that you give around this area is going to cause significant visual deterioration for the patient who otherwise may have not noticed this uh, if they were picked up on a routine eye check. <clears throat> and this all stems back to slightly traditional thinking about melanomas where the thought process is that by the time they present to us as clinicians in the uh, oncology clinic, their threshold event for getting metastatic disease has already happened. And so anything we do in terms of treatment or in terms of therapy is not going to change their metastatic potential because it's already occurred. They already have micrometastases in the blood uh, and there's nothing we can do about that. That is all an assumption based on slightly dated and probably slightly indirect evidence. And so if you look at some of the older evidence, this is very old evidence of patients who had a nucleation, so these are quite large tumors, uh, their peak of metastatic disease is about two years after their treatment at baseline here, which suggests that the, the metastatic event happened prior to that treatment. But like I said, this is old data with larger tumors who all needed nucleation way before digital imaging and OCTs, where we really weren't looking at and picking up smaller tumors at that stage. And this may be the case uh, for larger tumors, but perhaps not for smaller tumors. The other piece of evidence is that some, a proportion of patients do have tumor cells circulating in their bloodstream at presentation, but not all of them do. And again, is this, this increases your risk of metastatic disease and is a... Um, uh, predictive factor for a metastatic disease, but maybe it doesn't occur in those with smaller, lower risk tumors. And perhaps this is more uh, apparent in those with higher risk, larger tumors. And if you look at some mathematical modeling evidence, again, quite old evidence, if you take a, a lesion, a metastatic lesion, and you extrapolate that tumor doubling time right back to when that metastatic event happened, it uh, on modeling occurs way before presentation to the initial ophthalmologist. <clears throat> 
But again, this is a modeling uh, system that assumes that tumor doubling time is constant throughout its lifespan. We know that that's not really the case in, in uh, tumor cells where they uh, have different uh, tumor doubling rates according to the blood supply and according to the environment around it. So I would challenge that uh, thought process that, uh, that we had in the past, that that event of metastatic threshold has, has happened in all the patients that present to us in, in clinic. The problem is that metastatic disease is not easily treatable. All the agents that we have at the moment uh, aren't particularly successful. And even the new agents tend to be in a very small subgroup of patients, either with localized disease or with a certain subgroup uh, HLA subtyping. So realistically, we would like to try and catch these uh, lesions before they metastasize and maybe treat them before they occur. We know the risk factors for metastatic disease include age, sex, ciliary body involvement, extraocular extension, the cell type, the genetic subtype of the tumor. None of those we can change, really. We can't have no influence over that. The only thing we can influence is the size threshold at which we decide that we want to treat these lesions. And we know that size matters quite significantly. It's not just the Shields group. Many, many papers have shown that the smaller tumors metastasize a lot less than the larger tumors. The question is that, is that because the smaller tumors tend to be more benign, the more disomy three tumors, and the larger tumors are more likely to be monosomy three, or is it actually because if you treat them earlier, they metastasize less? <clears throat> and so we looked at this a few years ago at basically all our small tumors. So these are tumors less than two and a half millimeters in thickness, um, of which we treated about 1200 cases over the last 15 years or so. And of those, about 200 of them not only had a, a histopathological diagnosis, cellular diagnosis of melanoma, but also a quarter of them were monosomy 3, which completely goes against the uh, thought process that all these small tumors are benign disomy 3, low risk tumors. Almost a quarter of them are high risk, potentially fatal tumors. And if you look at their absolute risk of metastatic death from metastatic melanoma, these are the small monosomy 3 tumors, these are the large monosomy 3 tumors, you can say there's a diff significant difference in the mortality rate when you treat these small tumors than if you treat the large tumors. And even if you correct for lead time bias statistically, that relative risk is a lot lower in the small monosomy 3 uh, tumor group. So how can we try and uh, find these tumors early and treat them early and maybe prevent uh, metastatic disease before that threshold event? Uh, in the community, a lot of imaging techniques are, are much more common. So digital imaging and OCT. So we're detecting them a lot sooner. <clears throat> we also want to be thinking about them earlier when they're smaller, uh, even in the general clinics where we're looking for all those risk factors, subretinal fluid, orange pigment, the ultrasound, for example. And we want to be treating them sooner rather than later, rather than monitoring these obvious melanomas, even though they're small, uh, we'd like to be treating them sooner rather than later. So in summary, nevi are easy, watch them, but they do need a baseline photo and they need watching in the long term, whether it's in the hospital setting or in the community. The ones with one or two risk factors and you're not quite sure and you cannot definitely say this is a malignant melanoma or this is a, a benign lesion, you can watch them for progression, but again, they need serial photography to make sure that the, any changes are noticed earlier. The larger tumors are mainly treated, so the uh, big melanomas for, to try and retain as much vision as possible, to try and retain the eye as much as possible and to reduce the risk of extraocular extension. But I think our focus in the future will be these smaller, uh, melanomas, which theoretically, if we treat them earlier, may be our only way of influencing patient prognosis in the future. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Romana. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, I don't see any Q&A questions in the QA section, but um, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, there has been a recent publication by Bertel, Bertel D'Amato, that uh, in, in introduced a, a different kind of uh, screening system, the mole system. Uh, do you use it at all? Or could you um, say something about this or do you use the TFS or MDIM uh, classification? 
the, the models by Bertel is actually really very good. I think it's a really good uh, screening tool. I think it's mainly for optometrists and general ophthalmologists. And I think for anyone who's thinking about referring to an oncology center, that would be a really good checklist to go through because not only is it quite um, definitive and it's got in between, it's not yes or no, it's got kind of half, I'm not sure about orange pigment, for example. It also excludes ultrasound, which is really handy for people who don't do ultrasounds all the time. Um, and so I think that that is very good for people who are referring. As far as when they get to the oncology center, I think we use basically the TFSOM um, because that, those are the things that we look for. Heinrich, is there any, any comment from your side? Um, well, you, you talked about the risk factors. Is there any combination of risk factors that, you know, you um, is there a weighting basically between one or the other so that you're really concerned or not concerned? I think tumor progression is definitely a very strong risk factor. If you have definite evidence that this tumor or this lesion is growing, that would be my strongest worry if, if I saw a patient like that. But in terms of the indeterminates, for example, I think the strongest risk factors would be orange pigment and subretinal fluid out of all of them. And those are the ones mainly to look out for. And, and they're reasonably easy to pick up, I think, with OCTs nowadays and autofluorescence. They're not that difficult with the tech we've got now. I think, I think, one of, I think from my point of view, a very important uh, thing that you've uh, talked about and discussed is that, that there is a differentiation between monosomy three small and large tumors. And the, the, the traditional thinking some decades ago was that this was not the case. And uh, so I, I find this very important to, 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 to see even in these cases there, where we know that there is a monosomy to treat them as early as possible in order to, to, to uh, avoid, if it is possible, metastasis. So there must be other drivers for metastasis uh, uh, next to uh, monosomy. I think so. And I think that's the problem that we've had in the past. And it's something we need to challenge is the thinking that all these small tumors, if they're melanomas, are all disomies, And we know they're not. Um, and, and I think that's the, the argument that's been there for a long time. All these small tumors, they're all a kind of a bit benign, aren't they? So let's just watch them. And I think that's not true. I see there is no, no question at the QAA. So, so thank you very much, Romana, for this fantastic talk.